So uh, this week's speaker is uh, Dr. Joshua Pierce from uh, North Carolina State University. This continues the tour of uh, people Wakefield knows. Uh, uh, Josh got his uh, undergraduate degree from the University of Pittsburgh. And when he was there, he worked in the lab of uh, Peter Wick, apparently all four years. Uh, and then he was like, four years isn't enough. So he stayed at the University of Pittsburgh and uh, worked in the uh, WIF lab to get his PhD. We were, uh, for the last three of those years, like two labs down from each other. So we spent a lot of time together, him being smarter than me, clearly. Uh, and then uh, from uh, the University of Pittsburgh, he graduated in 2009. Uh, 2008? <coughs> Very same year I did? Good. See, way smarter than me. Uh, and then uh, he uh, went to uh, the Scripps University to work for Dale Boger, where he worked on making vancomycin analogs. Any of you have had me in organic? I was talking about vancomycin. I was talking about the guy who tried to change the oxygen to the nitrogen. This is that guy. So like every year in class, your, your, your postdoc work comes up. That's right. <laughs> Uh, and then in 2012, he started at NC State, where he's been uh, ever since, and he's been doing natural products photosynthesis and medicinal chemistry. He's going to talk about uh, using marine uh, natural products as uh, platforms for chemi chemical and biological discovery. Okay. All right, thanks for that introduction, Brian. Uh, I'm not sure smarter is really the thing. I think I just like punishment a lot more uh, sometimes. Uh, uh, so, so just a, a different selection there. Um, so uh, I'm happy to be here to talk to you guys about, about our program up at NC State. And I'm going to do my best to sort of present this in a way that's accessible to everyone. Um, and so if there are things that are not, you can feel free to uh, ask me about those afterward or um, even during if you'd like. Um, and so and at the very end, I'm going to say a few words about NC State's graduate program and things if anybody's interested um, um, so you can um, no. So I have a few slides that I don't normally put in these talks uh, if it's solely research-based, because I want to get everybody tuned in with what I'm going to tell you about and, and why it matters. And so you probably recognize the idea that elements come together to form molecules. And so the molecules that we talk about are some combination of these, these elements. And so you know, one of the big things in, in society these days is the idea of things being synthetic versus things being natural. And if you notice in my title of my talk, I'm talking about natural products. And you know, that has some implication with it. I think to the, the general public, that has the implication that these things are safe and not toxic and just wonderful. When in reality, that's actually not at all, not at all necessarily true. And in fact, whether something is synthetic or natural really <coughs> says nothing about its, its safety or efficacy. Some of the most potent uh, toxins and most deadly molecules are actually natural molecules and not synthetic at all. And so, so this, this idea of synthetic being bad is certainly not, not true. We'll talk about that later in the talk because we really want to be able to make synthetic things um, that, that have interesting biological properties. And so you can see lots of natural stuff and lots of synthetic things. And so molecules, I always like to get students acclimated to size of molecules, right? That's an interesting, interesting uh, thing. So you have you know, water and glucose. These are small molecules that, that you've probably heard of. You have antibodies and viruses, bacteria and cells, right? A period, right? And then, and then a baseball, right? And you can see sort of the scale Right, and, and having a relative appreciation for the size of things, I think, is very helpful and, and, and allows you to appreciate the size at which organic chemistry is conducted. Right, so we're dealing with very, very small things, and we're able to manipulate those small things in a way that is that is useful. And so, drug discovery and natural products is really going to be a, a theme that we talk about a lot. And I don't necessarily need you to read this whole slide. But what I can summarize this is that drug discovery is really the idea of identifying a molecule, an entity that is made up of these, these elements, that is able to elicit some effect that's beneficial. Right? And so aspirin relieves pain, you know, other drugs kill cancer cells, kill infectious bacteria. All of these drugs are able to do some biological effect. And so we want to think about making these molecules that can do that. Okay? And so if you wanted to do that, right, if you have all these elements available to you, how do you even think about getting started? Where do you go to get the tools or the ideas you would need to go after that? And so, so that's where the, the whole marine natural product comes, comes in. 
So natural products are molecules that nature makes. And so out in the trees outside here, in the grass, and in our case, in the oceans, there's organisms that are making molecules. Our bodies right now are making all kinds of different molecules, right? And we have biological systems that are able to take elements and piece them together into these molecules. And so we can take advantage of what nature does. We can learn from nature, and we can see the molecules that nature makes, and we can use them as inspiration to think about making them and then making other things um, known. As I mentioned, nature produces many, many compounds, and many of them are actually remarkably toxic, right? And so, for example, many mushrooms and different kinds of plants are actually horribly toxic if you would eat them, right? But the idea is that you grind anything up and put it in a bottle and sell it at the supermarket. As long as it's natural, then it's going to have some remarkable health benefit. Um, and so, so we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, and and so, so that summarizes there. So marine natural products in specific are the focus. And so these are fascinating structures. And so these molecules are isolated from the ocean. They're typically isolated from marine sponges. And so you've all probably seen pictures of you know, the Great Barrier Reef and all these beautiful colored sponges that grow on these, these ocean uh, <laughs> reefs. And these sponges harbor bacteria that live within them. And so there's all kinds of little bacteria that are living in these sponges. And these, spo these bacteria in these sponges are little, little factories of molecule-making machines that produce molecules that have a benefit to both the bacteria and the sponge. And so we could have a whole lecture just about marine bacteria and about the systems that make these and all that. They're really quite interesting. But the only thing that really matters for the sake of this talk is that there are bacteria out in the ocean that are making molecules and that these molecules have really interesting chemical structures. And so we want to use them as inspiration to, to, to um, drive new discoveries. They're very, very small in terms of the amounts that's prepared. And so if you went and you collected all of the sponges in the entire ocean and made all the uh, sponges extinct, right, which wouldn't be very uh, um, in vogue to do that, but let's just say you did that, right, you still wouldn't have enough molecule to even do limited studies in the lab to try to explore them as potential drugs. Right? You would use them all up, and then you would have nothing left. Right? What would you do then? You, ex you made a sponge extinct, and you didn't finish your studies in the lab. And so we want to be able to take and have synthetic chemical access to these molecules so that we can study them. And so, so we want to take these, these molecules that are coming from these sponges and identify small molecules that have some kind of biological activity. They kill bacteria, they you know, lower your blood pressure, they you know, treat your headache, whatever the, the um, you know, disease area is or the, the element is, that, that's what we're looking to do. And so what do these look like? So those of you that have taken organic chemistry, um, you've seen lots of molecules that have carbon in them and connected in all different ways. These are some examples of molecules, some smaller and some larger ones. These molecules are marine natural products. These are molecules that bacteria in marine sponges produce. And so if you've taken organic chemistry, you can appreciate <coughs> the complexity associated with these molecules. Right? If I asked everybody on a sheet of paper, design a synthesis with the reactions you know from organic chemistry of these, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of, of you know, really just slam dunk answers because there's a whole lot of things to consider here and, and, and combinations of atoms in ways that you don't necessarily think about a lot in sophomore organic chemistry. Right? And so, so we have to use all of that. That is the basis, but then you continue to build deeper and deeper in organic chemistry to be able to address these problems. For comparison, here's some molecules you might be more familiar with, obviously water, but vitamin C, sugars, Right? These are the structures of those molecules. And so you can compare, there's some similarities and some differences between them. I think the biggest difference in marine natural products often is that they tend to have a lot of nitrogen atoms in them. Right? And so nitrogen atoms are nearly as common in terrestrial natural products like you would find outside here. Um, and so from a synthetic chemistry point of view, my research group is interested in that because it allows us to work on different kinds of chemistry. <coughs> However, all of these molecules are, are useful and important. Um, you just can't work on everything. And so my research group is rather diverse in terms of our interests. We are synthetic organic chemists, and we think about making molecules. And so you can see that here in this left quadrant of this, this uh, scheme. And so we think about new ways of making bonds. And so if you want to make a molecule, right, if we go back and we look at these molecules, 
And I send you out and you spend a month looking in the literature at every way everybody's ever done anything. You might conclude at the end of that that there really isn't a way in the literature that you can make one of these key bonds that you need to make in this molecule. There might not be a very reasonable way of doing that. And so when you come back, if you're a synthetic organic chemist, you, you ask the question, can I develop a reaction that allows me to do that? Okay, and so you're going to do something nobody's ever done before to enable the synthesis of this molecule. And maybe this molecule goes on to cure cancer in 30 years, and maybe it doesn't. But at the end of the day, you're contributing to that, that area of development in a very fundamental way. And then maybe 10 years from now, you know, Professor Wakefield will be teaching in his uh, organic class the reaction you developed because it'll just be run-of-the-mill common stuff there. All of those reactions in that textbook at one point were a novel, fascinating discovery in a chemistry lab somewhere when somebody was trying to accomplish a, comp uh, a different transformation and they ended up finding that reaction and then developed it and developed and developed it. It just takes a whole bunch of years before that then filters down into a into an undergraduate textbook. But that, that's how it happened. Um, you just have to, to think about that in, in perspective, I guess. And so, but we're also interested in a number of other things. And so we're interested in using these small molecules in the field that, that's, you know, more, I'd say over the last 10 years really exploded, which would be called chemical biology, which quite simply is just the use and application of chemistry in biological settings. It's different than biochemistry in some ways, and we could talk about that for a long time, but, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but, but in general, it's the, it's the combination of chemistry and biology, and, and we can call it bio, biochemistry if that's, if that's uh, uh, something you want to do. It, it's okay. And so we take organic synthesis and chemical biology, and then we try to apply this. So we care about infectious disease and cancer and different disease states. Right? These are all really interesting applied areas. But just remember that the only reason we're able to think about any of this is because we're innovating over here in a very basic science way. I think one of the biggest things I always try to drive across to students is that new medicines, new treatments for disease, are not being delivered by doctors. They're being delivered by basic scientists across all of the different research areas. Chemists, biologists, right, biochemists you know, even biophysicists, and on and on and on, right? And so that's where the real innovation in this is coming from. You know, doctors prescribe medicines, but they don't develop medicines, usually. Um, some, some, uh, so as synthetic chemists, what do we do? I always use this analogy, right? So if you were a, a builder of a house, right, and somebody didn't give you any tools, you would go to the lumber yard, and you would buy all this lumber, and you would build houses, and they would all, be, they would all look the same. Right? Because every single builder would have the exact same lumber, and they wouldn't be able to modify it in any way. Right? It would be 8 foot long by 8 foot wide by 8 foot tall squares. Right? Everything would be. And you just nail that stuff together, and that's what you'd have. And so that's what biologists have to deal with without chemists. Right? If a biologist wants to make a molecule that selectively <laughs> interacts with a protein or selectively interacts with an <coughs> enzyme target, Right? If they can't buy that molecule somewhere, that molecule doesn't already exist, there's no tools to manipulate that chemical structure to modify it to, for that particular purpose. And so synthetic chemists can really come in and we can take these small building blocks that are readily available, maybe from the petroleum industry, maybe because that, that you know, grass outside happens to make a lot of these and we collect it and use it, whatever the origin is. So we take these and we use all of those reactions that are in your sophomore organic textbook plus all of these other reactions that I was just talking about us developing and we're able to then stitch these together and add different elements and make these complex structures which are now specifically designed in a structural, from a structural point of view to have a certain shape, to have a certain, have a certain set of properties and we're able to modify them then however we want. And so that's really the, the premise of what a synthetic chemist does. We take little things and make them into much more complicated structures, but we can do that in a very selective way. And that allows us to have a lot of control over, over what we do. And so I'm going to shift into a little bit about what my research group does, and I'm going to try again to keep it, to keep it approachable um, and not get into the nitty-gritty details too much. Just give you a, a general appreciation for the kinds of problems that, that we think about. And so, guanidinium alkaloids are just a, a name of a family of natural products. And so these molecules are isolated again from, from a marine source, so they're isolated from a sponge. 
And you can see that there's a lot of different kinds of structures here. You cannot know anything about chemistry. And you can look and see that there's different shapes and different substitutions and different elements on, on this, on this uh, slide. And so when you have these, these kinds of structures, right, there's all kinds of different properties of these molecules that scream out to you as you know, either exciting or horrifying, depending on your point of view. Right? And so some of them are that you have charges, right? So we have charge structures. And I think everybody can probably appreciate that if you have to make things that have charges on them, that that could be complicated because those molecules could be hard to handle. There could be weird pro they could have weird and unusual properties that, that are hard to, hard to deal with. You also see a lot of different stereochemistry, right? So everyone's favorite part of software organic chemistry is stereochemistry, right? Assigning things R and S you know, thinking about all of the, the fundamentals of priorities. And so we could really have fun doing R and S nomenclature for all the stereo centers in this molecule. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, what you can take away from that is that because there's all of those stereo centers, you have to think very, very carefully about how you're going to construct this molecule to install all of those stereo centers. And, you know, one of the things that sophomore organic chemistry really doesn't dig into much at all just because it's you know, not an appropriate time in your, your uh, chemistry development for this. But you learn about stereochemistry and you learn about controlling it <coughs> in a diastereo selective way. So you learn about you know, how carbocations do not have stereo control, but SN2 reactions, for example, you know, are backside attack. But you don't learn a lot about how you would think about controlling stereochemistry in more complex settings and, and how you think about that. And so just appreciate the fact that there's a whole other layer of coursework and thinking on top of that to think about addressing some of those problems. And so that's what graduate school would be about in organic chemistry, right? You start to be able to address those questions. But regardless, we have to think about how we're going to make these because these molecules are actually really potent against a number of different cancer cell lines. And so, and, ex and more excitingly for us, these kind of molecules actually selectively kill cancer cells over non-cancer cells. And so we want to understand how, right? And so all we know going into this project is that there's bacteria in a sponge that makes molecules. They look like this, okay? These molecules have an effect that somebody found by taking those molecules out of the sponges and testing them, okay? But now they don't have any more of those molecules, and we, have, we know there's the effect and we know there's the structure. We want to start asking the question of how does this structure, so we have this, these complex structures, how does that correlate to the function of the, that is observed biologically, right? And in order to do that, we have to be able to prepare these molecules synthetically. And so you can see that there's a number of different members of these families, and so some of them are outlined here. And what nature has done over, over the evolution of these biosynthetic pathways is that it's made all kinds of different family members, right? And so some of these members have this seven-membered ring and a six-membered ring, but others have a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring. Some of them have substitution here, and some of them don't. Some of them have this kind of simple, just polar anchor part but others have these really complicated, cyclized, <laughs> oxidized anchor parts. And so you start to ask a question of you have all, all of this different, different functionality and all of those different family members, and you have these effects biologically. How does any of this organic chemistry structure stuff correlate to any of that function? And can we actually dig in and understand that? And so those kind of questions are what really drives what we think about every day when we want to go make these molecules. Right? So we can learn a lot just by making these, because right? we can develop new synthetic chemistry that goes into sophomore organic books 25 years from now. But we also can think about how we can use that to then dig into these questions. And what we would love to be able to do is to be able to delete a lot of this complexity. So all the hard parts you see here, we'd like to be able to get rid of those and come up with a molecule that is a whole lot easier to make that retains the function. Right? That's really the ultimate goal, the long-term goal. But in order to do that, we have to have the complex thing so that we can then start deleting some of the complexity and understanding what parts are important and what parts aren't. Right? And so that's, it's a long-term goal. Right? It's not something you go in the lab and finish uh, in a week, but it's the, the sort of the overall vision um, that, that we hope to accomplish. And so, you know, there's a lot of things you can speculate about how different molecules work in biology. Right? And so there's all kinds of different things. 
These particular molecules could work a couple different ways, and some of them are quite simple to understand. Uh, one of them is that they could just bind anions. And so yeah, everybody can recognize that the natural products themselves have a positive charge on them, right? And so positive charges attract negative charges, <coughs> just plus minus attraction, right? And so these molecules are very caged too. So they have a cage structure with a positive charge. As you can imagine them being anion hosts, and so they can affect the flow of ions across cell membranes, right? And so you can think about all kinds of different effects that can have in, in, in terms of ion channels and other biology, and we, we won't dig into that here. But just appreciate, that's one possibility. It's an unknown, unknown effect, right? It's unclear whether that's it, but it's a possibility. The other possibility for these molecules is that they actually react with proteins. Right, so it turns out that you know, organic molecules are everywhere, including constituting all of us. Right? And so all of our proteins and enzymes and every biological molecule in us is just a very, very complex organic molecule. Right? And they have all kinds of nucleophilic groups on them. Oxygen, OHs, SHs. Right? So the amino acids, for those of you, you know, who have taken biochemistry, I'm sure you've learned the, the 20 amino acids. Right? Many of those amino acids have residue, have substitutions on them that are nucleophiles, right? So if you combine your organic chemistry class with your biochemistry class, you can look at your amino acids and you can say, some of them just have carbon chains, right? But others have OHs and SHs like serine and cysteine, right? And so those nucleophiles can react with other organic molecules and you can get a biological effect that way. And so it's possible that these molecules are also acting via that. And what's really cool is that in 2016, we have the technology in analytical chemistry, in mass spectrometry, that we can actually directly ask the question, does these small molecules attach to a protein? And we can look at every single protein in a cell and ask the question, do any of them have this molecule <laughs> attached to them? It's really amazing and, how fa and the efficiency and efficacy that that can be done at. So that field is called proteomics. It's the, the study of, of uh, proteins. But if you, if you think about where that field has gone over the last 10 or 15 years, it's amazing that you can actually do that, right? You can, you can it's, you know, not quite real time, but it's, it's, uh, it's amazingly fast. I think it's something like 35 protein fragments a second that you can, that you can analyze. So the amount of data that you generate in, you know, a minute, is, is quite impressive. And so, you know, much, much as a lot of things in science these days, one of the biggest struggles we have is data storage and data analysis, because the informatics required to evaluate the data you get is, is actually the, the much harder part than acquiring the data right now. And so, I'm not gonna dig into the details of our synthetic plan today, but I'll just show you the general idea of how you'd think about this, right? So, if we wanna make a molecule that's this you know, pentacyclic guanidinium complex marine alkaloid thing, right? You see that and you say, how am I going to do that? Well, you think about it generally in a reverse sense. It's called retrosynthetic <laughs> analysis, and you may or may not have heard that term before. But that, that idea is that you just deconstruct a molecule backwards. And so you get an idea of how you might make it. And so this is, this is our vision of how we might make this molecule going backwards starting with something simple and building up complexity, right? And so then the question becomes, what kinds of chemical reactions can you use to assemble that in a forward sense? Some of them might need to be developed, and others can just be adapted from what people have already done before us. And so, so that's the uh, idea. And so, you know, when you present this to students, so if, you're, you know, if any of you are thinking about graduate <laughs> schools for a master's degree or a PhD, you know, and, and in organic chemistry, you're going to be presented with molecules you need to make, right? And it's inevitably true that the simpler and more obvious it is, the harder it's actually going to be, right? And so it, it can be a real struggle sometimes to, uh, to do this. And so we envisioned these kind of, these kind of uh, organic groups. They're called beta-lactams, these little four-membered rings. We envisioned these as being really kind of easy building blocks. We wanted to make these quite straightforwardly. But it turns out that they're actually really, really hard to make because of one little thing, right? And this, this is a, a key point here. They have this acyl group on. They have this extra carbonyl here, right? So in organic two, you probably learned about carbonyl chemistry, right? And carbonyl chemistry, right, is great, but these carbonyls can do a lot of bad things too. Right? A lot of things you don't want them to do. 
right? And so it turns out that that plagues the synthesis of this, and there's all kinds of problems. And you actually get a completely different kind of chemistry. You get four plus two cycloadditions, which you guys would recognize as being Diels-Alder reactions, right? At some point, uh, it depends on what book you're using and what curriculum, but whether it's organic one or organic two, but you, you, uh, you learn about Diels-Alder reactions, and those reactions are effectively what's going on here for these, for these systems. And so along the way, right, during this problem solving to make these building blocks, you end up getting sidetracked into reactions that you didn't really expect to be the case. Right? And so you have to do something about that. And so in our case, we went ahead and did something with that reaction. Right? So we developed a new reaction that allows us to make these oxygen four ohms. So these are a, diff a di totally different class of heterocycle. But the whole reason we learned how to do this was because we were working on that marine natural product. And we wouldn't have tried to do those reactions if we weren't trying to make those other compounds. And so along that way, we found this. And so we went ahead and explored the chemistry and put it into a, a, a journal, article, journal article so that other people could go ahead and use it in the future if they ever wanted to make something like this, right? It doesn't help us make our natural product, but it contributes to the, to the community and helps, helps us learn about how to do this. And so I'll, I'll leave you then with just sort of how we end up doing this. And, and there's a couple reactions here that, that everybody will, will recognize. And so... You have some reductions and, and some amide bond formation, right? So you have, you have the formation of an amide, so that's the carboxylic acid derivatives chapter of uh, software organic. We then convert an alcohol to a leaving group, right? So that, that's a software organic reaction in the alcohol and, uh, chapter that, that uh, you convert alcohols to leaving groups. And then we do, this looks really fancy, and we form this really complex molecule here and all this stuff, right? But all, the, all this is, is the deprotonation of this NH, followed by an SN2 reaction on this activated alcohol, right? So there's a, there's a classic software organic reaction, right? So we're using an SN2 reaction, right? And then, and then we have some carbonyl chemistry and some other stuff. But just, just to recognize the fact that we are using reactions that you guys are learning in software organic to assemble these, these molecules. We're also using some more complicated chemistry that you didn't learn, but you know, it's a combination thereof and building on it um, as you go. And so we can make this, we now, I'm not gonna talk about it today, but we have molecules that are more functionalized, so we've built these up further and cyclized them further, and so we're getting there, right? We're along the way to being able to make these molecules and developing chemistry to do that that's spinning off along the way. Okay. The other thing I'll get back to very briefly here at the end is that remember these, these complex natural products had another side to them, right? So they have this side, but they also have this one. We also developed chemistry to make this. There's some really cool compounds here um, the, that are uh, uh, actually probably quite dangerous. And so the, the compound in the middle here, this diazoazide, for, for uh, uh, just so everybody knows, when you start getting nitrogen counts in molecules to be higher than carbon counts, the molecules tend to be explosive, right? And so um, it's more than likely that this molecule is reasonably explosive, but we don't concentrate it. Um, and so we, we avoid some of those issues, um, but still it, it, it's uh, something that ideally in, in uh, modern synthetic chemistry, the way this would likely <coughs> be handled is to do this reaction in flow. And so whenever you guys do reactions, you have a, a, a flask, right? And you just dump stuff in there and you stir it. So everything's together in a flask. Right, that's typically how you do a reaction. Well, there's been a lot of uh, uh, investigation into instead of doing that, could you actually do things in the tiniest little tubes and pump them? Right? And so you have the reagents coming through tubes and mixing, but because it's in these tiny little tubes, it's at an <coughs> ultra small scale at any given time. Right? So it's micro scale always. And so then you flow that together and you do, but, but since you're continuously pumping, right, although it's micro scale, it adds up out the other side. Right? You continue to manufacture it. So that's called flow chemistry. It's a really big field. And it allows you to do things that you might not be able to do so easily. Because for example, no company, no big chemical company is going to make a molecule like that in a big reactor. Because if one thing goes wrong, the entire town's going to be gone, right? And so you have to think about how to handle that. In an academic lab, we're doing it on a scale that isn't so dangerous. But, you know, when you go to the next step, if a pharmaceutical company comes to us and says, 
we want to have 37 kilograms of this stuff, right? That's great, but we're going to have to think about a lot of engineering aspects of this chemistry. It's where a lot of chemical engineering comes into play to be able to do what we're doing on scales like that, right? Because that's not something we even think about usually. We're much more interested in just getting our hands on some of the molecule. Um, but that shows you another role for chemists Right, so chemists do that stuff too. Right, so some chemists, instead of figuring out how to make a molecule for the first time, they figure out how to make molecules on ton scale. Right, I mean, think about the scale that some of the pharmaceuticals that you would go to the drugstore and get must be made on each year. Right, just huge. I mean, just you know, not like little flasks. We're talking about you know dump trucks full of this stuff. Right, um, of course not hauled in dump trucks because that would not be very FDA uh, approved. But um, you get the idea. So anyways, we, uh, we make these molecules, this is the other side, and so we can do things with these as well um, and study their properties and, and things. And so, you know, we've, we're working on developing different syntheses of these and we're able to do that and, and you get an idea of how organic chemistry plays into all of that. Um, and and I, won't, I won't belabor that too much. For the last bit of the science part of my talk, I want to talk about a different set of molecules which are much smaller. Okay, so, so you saw these earlier on one of my examples of what a natural product is. But these are called the, the synoxazolidinone and the lipoxazolidinone natural products. They're called that because they have this, this key ring in the middle here, and this is called an oxazolidinone. So the name is coming from this red ring here. Okay, the four corresponds to where the different header atoms are in this ring. But, but in general, that's it. So you can see it here, 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 and there. And so that's why their the, the names are the oxazolidinones. And so these molecules were isolated by uh, isolation chemists who went down and collected the sponge and found these molecules. And they were found to have some modest antimicrobial activity against some gram-positive bacteria. So, some, some, so these are uh, MRSA, so methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. You've probably heard of a MRSA infection. It's a really nasty infection that's... Uh, um, uh, nobody really wants to get, but it is treatable. Right? You don't die for the most part. Um, so, so although that's starting to change. Um, and so, so we have the, uh, th that activity. And so for us, remember, we're synthetic chemists, right? And so our first thought is here's two new molecules. We want to think about new ways that we can use organic chemistry to make them, right? But then we want to figure out how we can modify them and change them and maybe even hopefully simplify them to improve these numbers to make them more exciting biologically, right? So those are, those are our goals. And so to do that, we had to think about a way to do it, and we're actually going to do it via cyclization reaction. And so we're just cyclizing a compound like this. You can follow these arrows to see what's happening from here to here. So that's the idea. And we can access these kind of intermediates a number of different ways. And so just take my word for the fact that we can do that, um, and, and I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. And so this is what a synthetic scheme to these natural products might look like. And so my students will take commercial materials that we can buy from outside companies that sell chemicals, and we'll take those molecules, and in three steps we can make something that looks like that. Okay? And so then, with that in hand, we can take this aldehyde and condense it with an amine to make an imine. Okay? That's in the amine chapter of sophomore organic. And, and you lose water in that process, right? Organic chemists are always horrible with the, the mass balance of reactions, right? <coughs> if we lose some small molecule, it just vanishes into the blue, right? There's water here, but it's, it's, it, it uh, reacts with magnesium sulfate, and, and uh, we ignore it for the most part. Uh, but, but regardless, uh, for, you know, in gen chem, that's like crucial. And then you get to organic, and it's like, oh yeah, it's just there, and it goes away. And so we have these imines. These imines then react with these acid chlorides, and then do that cyclization reaction I showed you on the previous slide to make our key ring that we need. And then we remove some of these groups that are called protecting groups, which are just there to cover up all of the things that might react and be and get in our way. And so we, we cover, them, cover them up until then we can remove them at the very end. And so we're able to take commodity chemicals and convert them in a matter of five steps to this natural product in about 20% yield. So if we started with you know, 10 grams, we end up with two grams of material. I guess if we started with 10 moles, we end up with two moles of material. The grams isn't gonna work so well, but you, you, um, either way, 20%. So we, we, get this, we get this natural product. And so 
So what do we do with this? So, so in my lab, we make the molecules, but we also look at them biologically. And so we get bacteria, <coughs> and, we, and we look at the effect of these molecules on, this ba on these bacteria. And so we have different efficacies against different strains of bacteria. Some of these are gram-positive at the top, and some of them are gram-negative. Right, if you're not familiar with bacteria, that's just whether or not they stain with gram stain. Right? And so it's just, it just has to do with their cell, their cell uh, walls, the difference between gram-positives and gram-negatives. Gram-negatives tend to be a whole heck of a lot harder to kill. They're a much bigger problem overall than gram-positive bacteria. But both, but both um, are problems, depending on which uh, strain we're talking about. And so I think the biggest thing to recognize, and the biggest thing to appreciate about this, is that you know, chemistry, I was talking to the students at lunch today, you know, chemistry is a molecular science. We think about things at an atomic and molecule based level. And this is the ultimate example of how subtle you know, chemistry and biology together are. And so here we have these two molecules. The only difference between these two molecules is the presence or absence of this one chlorine atom. Okay? It's the only difference between these. But in some of these gram-negative strains of bacteria, these are actually greater than 500. And we start to get you know, activity here. So we're you know, five, in some cases, tenfold more active, simply by the installation of one atom. Right? And so the molecular interactions and the physical properties of these molecules are able to, to be fine-tuned down to the degree of just one atom change. And so that just shows you how, how specific some of these interactions are. And so we then try to make a whole bunch of other molecules, right? We made the natural product, let's make more. And so we can take non-natural <laughs> building blocks and combine them together and make all kinds of different things that are not natural anymore. They're completely synthetically contrived, right? And so we just mix things together to, to see what happens. And so then you can learn, so SAR means structure activity relationship, right? And so we compare the structure to the biological activity and develop some kind of relationship between them. So we can learn things about what's important and what's not important. And so we have things like this, this aromatic group prefers to be electron withdrawing, electron poor, if we have good activity. If we put some kind of carbon group on this nitrogen instead of a hydrogen, that's really, really bad. Right? Halogens are preferred at this site. This group, this nitrogen-containing group, isn't really important at all for the gram-positive bacteria, but is very important for the gram-negative bacteria. Right? And so that's an, an interesting uh, point. So, so we learn lots of different things about the molecules and how the structure correlates to this function. And so then we can continue to evolve and change and optimize, and eventually you can get compounds that are better. Right? And so here we have a compound now that has improved activity, and you can see the structure. So it's different than the natural product, but it still retains the core of that natural product. Right? And so we've learned things and done better. But at the end of the day, all of these molecules are pretty mediocre antimicrobial agents. Right? So you think about this, you, know, you call up you know, a big pharmaceutical company, you call up Pfizer or Merck or GlaxoSmithKline or something, and you say, you know, I have a molecule that kills MRSA, and it does that at four micrograms per mil. And they say, that's nice and you're never going to hear from them again, right? Because it's just not good enough, right? It's not active enough. And so we've tried to evolve chemically these <coughs> molecules to be more active, but we really haven't been able to do that well enough. And so, as you remember, I said that my group thinks a lot about how structure correlates to function. But that function can be anything, right? And if you think about these molecules that are in these marine sponges being produced by these bacteria, the bacteria are producing these, and then they're being excreted into the ocean, right, to protect it themselves and the sponge, or to, to have some effect. It's pretty unreasonable to think that nature is evolving these natural products as weapons to kill other bacteria if they're this crappy at killing bacteria, right? That's not a very effective weapon. If you look at most of the biological toxins that ocean organisms produce, we're talking about molecules that one molecule will kill you sitting right here. I mean, they're amazingly potent molecules, right? I mean, just crazy potent. And so th this just doesn't seem quite right. And so we really started to think about, you know, do these molecules actually have biological function that has nothing to do with killing bacteria? And so where do you begin? Where do you think? That's the problem, right? How do you think about what function you might go after? Well, it turns out we got a little bit lucky. 
and, and just started thinking about function in a particular way. And that way is in bacterial biofilms. And so, you know, you guys are close to the ocean here, and there's a lot of uh, marine science that happens. And so, you know, I think this is a very uh, relevant topic. Biofilms are fascinating. And so all a biofilm is, is a community of bacteria that's within a matrice of, of uh, an extracellular matrice, which is comprised of sugars and, and other uh, um, uh, molecules. They just encapsulate the bacteria and protect it from its environment. And so if you ever saw a big uh, ship that has a bunch of growth and buildup on it, that's biofouling. And so that's back a lot of that is bacteria that is, that is stuck in biofilms to that ship. And for example, the US Navy spends hundreds of millions of dollars in fuel costs every year because this bacteria slows the ships down um, in the water. And so um, dental uh, plaque. Uh, implants, when you get surgical implants, if you get infections related to them, most of the time it's because biofilms form on those implants and they harbor the, the, the uh, infectious bacteria and then antibiotics don't work. And so, so biofilms are implicated in about 80% of chronic and recurring infections. And you can kind of just imagine in a physical sense how this is, right? If you have an infection, and you go take all your antibiotics, you kill all of the bacteria that are floating around and, and replicating. Right? But then, some of the bacteria are somewhere inside of you. They formed a biofilm. Okay? That biofilm is about a thousand times less sensitive to the antibiotic than that free-floating bacteria is. And so the dose of antibiotic you were taking doesn't kill the biofilm. But you feel better, right? You feel great because you killed all the free-floating bacteria. But then, you stop taking the antibiotics. And one day, the, those biofilms release all of that bacteria again. And now, you still have a recurring infection. The bad part is that that infection is likely more resistant to the antibiotics because it was subjected to a concentration of them for so long. And so you've kind of self-selected for the strongest bacteria among them. And so now, you, when you go to the doctor, they don't give you the same antibiotic anymore. They give you the next one up, right? And so this is sort of the, the basis of a lot of the antibiotic resistance problems we have. There's other issues with it, too. One of them is simply people feel better in two days and they really haven't killed all the bacteria at all. And then, and then they stop taking their antibiotic, but all, all they did was just do a, do a you know, microbiology experiment in themselves to develop resistant mutants, which is you know, not, not advised to uh, do. Um, we'll talk about that at the very end for one minute. But anyhow, at the end of the day, there are very few small molecules that are able to do anything with these biofilms. Right? If you needed to take the FDA-approved antibiotics at a level to kill biofilms, those antibiotics would kill you before you kill the biofilm. It's such a high dose. Right? You'd have to literally like, scoop this stuff into yourself to get a concentration high enough. Right? So it doesn't work. And so um, we wanted to explore our compounds at this. And like I said, we, we got lucky. And so we have analogs of our small molecules that we found that are able to inhibit biofilm formation. And so if we have bacteria and we add our small molecule, it inhibits those bacteria from forming the biofilms. So that's useful. And you can think about it maybe even in a materials chemistry sense. If you could make, if you could make uh, materials that had the ability to not allow bacteria to form biofilms, you could use those in implants, you could make ships out of them, coast ships with them and all this stuff, right? And so, so there's lots of applications for it. And the activity is pretty good, actually. And so in cancer and things, right, you need to be nanomolar or picomolar. In the world of biofilms, there really isn't anything better than this, right? So single-digit micromolar is pretty good. And so we're excited about that. We're even more excited because we're doing this without killing the bacteria at all. <coughs> and so the bacteria are growing at the same rate. They're simply not forming biofilms anymore. So that's useful, right? So there's less evolutionary pressure against us because we're not threatening the bacteria's life. Right? The reason that the resistance develops is because you select um, via, via the fact that you're killing them. Right? But if you're not killing them, it's not that resistance can't develop. It can. It's just at a much, much slower rate. And, and it's much more random as opposed to uh, um, forced. And so we made a number of compounds. We were also very excited to see that not only can we inhibit biofilms from forming, but we can also disperse them once they're formed, which clinically and medically is much more interesting. Right? And so if you go and you, you know, have an infection, you could imagine having a dual treatment with an antibiotic and a biofilm dispersal agent to make sure that biofilms aren't building up in you. And because once they're dispersed, those bacteria are easily killed by, by antibiotics. 
Um, and so, you know, it's one, one of the things I think that's interesting about this infectious disease area is that at least in the world of biofilms, you can have infections that are resistant to treatment of antibiotics without the bacteria themselves actually being resistant to the antibiotic, right? And, so I, and then you can have other bacteria that, that are also resistant to it, and so that's interesting. So the last thing I want to talk about for science, very, very briefly, is the other member of the foroxazolidinones. And so this is a same core structure, but different side chains, right? So we've changed what's attached to that core structure. Nature has changed what's attached. Also isolated from a marine bacteria. Um, these, we envisioned a very, very straightforward way of making these, where we simply cyclize an alcohol onto this carbonyl, and then lose water, and you get this. Right, so it was kind of simple chemistry. But sometimes you want chemistry. By the way, you know, chemists inherently don't want chemistry to be complicated. We want it to be useful, right? And so in this case, we were hoping that we could develop something that, that's, that's straightforward. And so we were able to just develop a couple step synthesis of this core. It works really well. Um, and so we can, we can do that. And then we were able to extend this to the natural compounds. And so we can make these. This chemistry comes from amino acids, so this is an amino acid type compound, right? So it's an alpha amino acid. Um, for those in, in biochemistry who recognize that, that structure, right? And so we can convert these amino acids to these amino al to these uh, uh, hydroxy acids, right? So the NH2 for the OH, really interesting uh, organic mechanism question here, right? Because we retain the stereochemistry perfectly, right? And so we go from a chiral amino acid to a chiral uh, alcohol. And then we just protect that and, and, and convert it. And so then we're able to do the same chemistry. And in conclusion, we can make this natural product. That's all that really matters right here, right? We can take these chemicals and mix them together and make the natural product. So now we have this, and we confirmed that it kills bacteria like the isolation chemist said. So this is much more potent to start with, right? But from a drug discovery point of view, this molecule is nasty looking, okay? It's got all these carbons. And if you can appreciate that, you know, water and carbons don't mix together, right? Salad dressing, right? So the oil doesn't mix with the water. This molecule looks a whole lot more like the oil than it does the water. And so if you think about taking this thing orally for a drug, it's not going to have any oral availability. It's going to be like drinking vegetable oil, right? It's not, there's no way it's going to dissolve and, and be able to um, be, be incorporated in your bloodstream to act as a drug. And so that's not good. But additionally, it's got reactive functionality in it, right? This group, right, if we just ignore all of this, that's an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. And so this alkene is an electrophile. It wants to react with nucleophiles. And typically, people get really worried whenever you make molecules that have electrophiles in them. Because I told you guys earlier that, that bacteria and, and, uh, and our bodies are full of proteins and things that have all these nucleophiles in them, right? And so how are you going to react an electrophile with, how are you, how's that going to even get to its target, let alone um, um, do what you want? So, so anyway, lots of concerns. And so for us, we made the natural product, but we needed to start addressing these issues, right? Can we simplify this thing and get rid of this problem? They probably wouldn't be telling you about it if we couldn't do that, so we can do it, right? And so we can do some things that are very bad, right? So if we truncate these long carbon chains, we kill the activity, right? If we remove the methyl group from that alkene, we increase the activity. But most excitingly, when we delete that alkene altogether, we actually have activity that's very similar to the natural product. And so if we delete that electrophile, we still have activity. And so we're not killing bacteria because of some broad, toxic, electrophilic effect, right? So, I mean, lots of things kill bacteria, right? Concentrated nitric acid kills bacteria, right? Bleach kills bacteria. But you can't exactly drink bleach to cure your infection, right? So there's, there's, you know, there's a difference between being able to kill bacteria and doing it via a mechanism that's appropriate for therapeutic development, right? Those are, are two very different things. And so, so here we have an uh, uh, exciting molecule. Where we got really excited was if we add steric hindrance, so big organic things, right? In organic chemistry, I always tell my students, there's two things. There's sterics, which is size, and there's electronics, right? which is positive and negative charge. Every single thing in organic chemistry can pretty much be described by sterics or, or electronics, right? And so the same is true for when you think about small molecules interacting with protein targets or enzyme targets or whatever, whatever molecular actions. The interactions are either driven by sterics, which is just size-size complementarity, right? So, you know, round things fit into round things, 
right? Or it's driven by charge plus minus, right? And in this case, we don't have a lot of charge. We have only well, have the lone pairs, right? And so we can think about those. But in this part of the molecule, it's just carbons, right? So we're just looking at size complementarity, right? And so it turns out that if it's if it's uh, truncated and, and more sterically bulky, we now get really exquisitely potent activity against MRSA. So 0 0.0338 micrograms per mil. And so we've really increased the potency of the natural products quite a lot, still lacking that. And so over, over time, we've been able to, to improve these even more. Um, we can now have compounds that have aryl rings over here. And so that, that's exciting. And we're moving now to think about having hetero atoms over there so that we can increase their polarity. And lots, there's lots of uh, drug discovery properties that we won't get into that you might want to have. But regardless, they're much more potent compounds. They're much less grease balls that, that, that look really bad. And so we're excited about, about where this can go. We've looked at it against a number of different bacteria of relevance, and so these bacteria are all resistant to common antibiotics that you might get at the, the doctor. And so we want to see, do we have efficacy still, still against those? Um, sure enough, we do. Um, here's a sort of antibiotic of last resort. So if you get a gram-positive infection and you're really, really sick, there's one of two molecules they're going to give you. One of them is vancomycin, which Brian already mentioned, and the other is linazolid, which is shown here. Right? And so if those don't work, you know, that's when the doctor starts walking really slowly in and, you know, it's not, it's not looking good because, um, you know, those are really two of the antibiotics of last resort for gram-positive infections. Uh, um, they have to do some much more aggressive treatments after that. We also have tried to find resistant mutants, right, because we want to be able to use that for a number of different things. But in general, it's been hard for us to do that. You can see molecules like fusidic acid, we can very readily generate resistance in our compound, we're not seeing that. We're now in a second phase of efforts where we're being much more aggressive about trying to generate those resistant mutants and more on that uh, soon. And we're also able to eradicate biofilms with these molecules. Now notice we still take a pretty big hit in our activity. We were at 0 0.03 micrograms per mil in the free floating stage, but now we're at three micromolar. But still we're at a clinically perhaps relevant concentration to eradicate biofilms versus, you know, if you put linazolid in this, you're looking at probably a three or 400 micro, micromolar um, dose required for this. So we're excited about it. We have selectivity against mammalian cells. The next stage is to put these into rodents and see how the rodents do, see if we can cure MRSA in rodents, and then it really goes from there. And so um, lots, of, lots of issues with that. And so, but all of this started because we were interested in how we might think about making the bonds in this compound. Right? And so I think that's really what the message I want to leave everybody with, is that we're thinking about chemistry, right, always. And the students are taking classes about how to make molecules. But we get to do all this stuff, too. So my students that did the chemistry did all the biology you saw. Everything was done by the, quote, chemists, right? But, you know, you can see that it's highly interdisciplinary and, and that, you know, um, I think that a lot of this now is turning very much into what I'll call chemical biology, because we're trying to use these molecules to understand what biological targets they're going after. And so we're trying to, to use um, um, tools to explore these um, in terms of their function to really understand how they're working. And that's where most of the uh, mef effort efforts are. Um, and so, you know, I'll just summarize with this bottom here. All of this is because we think about marine natural products and we learn stuff, right? We learn about chemistry, we learn about biology a lot of which we didn't expect to learn going into it, right? We had absolutely no idea that we were going to find small molecules that were affected against biofilms, and we might find out that we're hitting targets or pathways that were completely unexpected, right? And, but that would be a great, a great result. Um, this is my group, um, and so the, some of these are undergrads and some are graduate students. I think I have 10 graduate students now, um, and so you can see the names here of those that did the work. Very thankful for funding agencies for being very generous to us. Um, and, and I'm not going to let you go quite yet. I'm going to show you um, one other thing, and I'll just show a few of these, a few of these slides. Um, but I, I did want to give the graduate program uh, at NC State just a couple mentions. Um, so this is, this is uh, our bell tower at NC State, if any of you have been to Raleigh. Um, this is sort of the end part of campus coming in. Um, there's a new Aloft Hotel right here, so you can actually stay right across from the bell tower. Um, and this is Hillsborough Street, um, that's sort of the north end of campus. Um, but NC State, um, you know, it's here in the Research Triangle, right? And so we're in Raleigh, Duke's in Durham, and UNC's in Chapel Hill, 
right? And so we're about 25 minutes from both of them. Um, and so it's really convenient to get in between the universities. NC State is the sister school to UNC. And so we're part of the UNC system. We have the same board of governors, right? And so I, I think oftentimes uh, people think that we're different institutions. We're really the same institution. NC State has engineering and vet school. UNC has the law school and, and uh, the medical school. Um, and so that's how it's, you know, sort of that, that uh, historic land grant, uh, non land grant uh, university setup. And so we have, I think, now about 36,000 um, students, and so a reasonably large university, um, 2,300 faculty. Um, and this is outdated now, but I think it's $360 million in sponsored research awards. Um, and so, I, and I think maybe fifth or sixth in universities without medical schools. Um, and so we're, we're really doing better in that. Um, Raleigh is great. If you haven't been to Raleigh, you should come, whether or not you want to go to graduate school at NC State. We get all kinds of awards for all kinds of stuff. Um, it's growing rapidly, almost too rapidly, I would say. Um, and so that, that has uh, lots of impact on traffic. Um, but uh, it's something like 200 people a week move to, move to uh, greater Raleigh area, um, which adds up quite quickly. Um, and, and so anyways, lots of, lots of interesting things about Raleigh. Um, we have about 130 graduate students in the Department of Chemistry. Um, we have 30 tenure-track faculty. Um, it takes about five years to get a PhD on average. Um, we have, you know, competitive stipends and benefits. For those of you that don't realize this, if you go to graduate school in the sciences, you get paid to do that. Um, no tuition, health benefits, plus a stipend. Um, and so um, be happy to answer any questions anybody has about any of that. Um, we have all the facilities that you might imagine one having. Um, we get external funding from a whole bunch of different places, um, which, which isn't so surprising. And, and this part I won't go through. Uh, if anybody wants this after the fact, I'll be happy to send it to you, um, or, or I can send Brian some flyers that he can have too. But we have faculty in all of the different research areas, and, and they're listed here, and it just talks generally about what those research areas are. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this point. I, I will highlight um, the organic division. Um, here and so, so we actually have two additional faculty now in organic. So organic is our biggest division um, by far, and a lot of these faculty members are very much at the interface of biology, even much more than I am, right? And so Gavin Williams, I'll highlight here. Um, Gavin's a synthetic biologist, and so Gavin is doing everything that I'm doing, except for he's trying to use bacteria to actually do it. Okay, and so he wants to use bacteria to make molecules and be able to engineer, not to make the molecule it's already making, right? It can already do that, right? But how do you get a bacteria to make a molecule it's not making, right? So that's the field of synthetic biology. But synthetic biology is a chemistry thing, not a biology thing, right? Because you need to have the molecular understanding, not, the, not just the systems understanding, right? It's really hard to do that. Um, so anyhow, more, we can talk more about that later. Computational, um, the chemical biology, synthetic biology, drug discovery, I talked about all of that. And also chemical education. Um, not every department has a full tenured chemical education faculty member. Maria Oliver Hoya is fantastic. Um, she always takes uh, one or two students every year. And so, so definitely if you're interested in that. And I'll just leave you with this. So our application deadline is January 15th. If anybody is just curious and thinks they might want to go to chemistry graduate school and wants to apply and take the chance, it's completely free for domestic students to apply to our program. Okay, so there's no fee attached. Um, so it, there's, there's a $75 fee, but just say you're sending a check and then never send the check, and the department writes the check on your behalf. So we still have to pay the graduate school um, because, you know, administrators always want their check. But we waive, we waive the fee for domestic students. And so if you're, if you're a domestic student, you can get away with that. If, there's an international, if you're an international student, uh, there's not anything we can do about it for a number of, of very complicated reasons. Um, Transcripts, personal statement, three letters, GRE scores. Only the general GREs, not the chemistry GREs, are required, and so you don't have to take the subject test. And then if you're international, you need your TOEFL score, and uh, we'll have to go through a, a wonderful phone interview and language test and all of these things. But uh, in general, the only comments I'll make here is that your personal statement is important. Don't ignore it when you apply to graduate school. Um, your transcripts are what they are, but you can use your personal statement and your letter writers to help sort of massage any issues that might be on those transcripts. So make sure that happens. And as I was telling the students at lunch, these letters 
Don't take this lightly. Just because you took somebody's class and got an A does not mean they can write you a reasonable letter of recommendation. Right? It has to say something more than that. And you at least have to have one person that can say a lot more than that. Right? You know, and if you don't, it's going to be a big problem um, to get into graduate school. Um, and obviously, um, some type of, of research experience is, is useful, even if that's not at your university. It could be somewhere else. It could be in the summer. It could be a variety of different mechanisms to accomplish that. But, but that, that can be important. Um, and so anyways, you can apply online. Like I said, we waive the fee. Lots of information on the chemistry website about, about us. Check us out. Um, and you know, obviously, Brian knows how to contact me if uh, anybody has any questions or, or anything like that. So happy to answer anything, though. Thank you for listening. Yeah. So, uh, have you learned anything about biofilms based upon, right, you've got your different compounds and they either will kill the biofilm or kill the cells? Yeah. So what, do you, what, what does that tell you? Yeah, so, so it's interesting. So they share this core functional group, right? And so the, the question really is, is there overlap between the mechanisms of how they work between them? We're starting to convince ourselves that, that there may be but the, the biofilm compounds almost certainly are working via, via targeting some two-component signaling pathway in bacteria. And so that's how most compounds known with biofilms work. And so you know, biofilms form because the bacteria you know, signal to each other that there's some stress induced or you know, there's, there's uh, some, you know, uh, something going on that they need to, to gather into these protective, protective biofilms. And so, um, we think actually that it's, it's quite possible, and we don't have yet uh, really huge evidence to support it, certainly for publication, that these actually could be homosterine lactone mimics. And so homosterine lactone is a, is a small molecule that's produced by gram-negative bacteria as a quorum sensing agent. And so quorum sensing is what those bacteria use to communicate with each other in a, in a community of bacteria. Gram-positive bacteria don't function like that, but these quorum sensing molecules still have those kind of effects in gram-positive bacteria. And so it's possible that they mimic them and are actually just acting as a, a synthetic replacement for the natural signaling molecules. And so we're basically just fooling the bacteria into thinking that you know, they're home free and they release them to biofilms. In terms of the mechanism of action for the bacteria's cytal compounds, um, that's much more uncertain. We know some things they don't do, um, but we, we don't know how they work yet. Um, and so we're really using every single approach on the planet, including lots of genetic mutants and obviously trying to grow the mutants, but also screening against um, knockouts to, to look for you know, ones that, that uh, aren't sensitive or additionally sensitive to our compounds. Uh, we're doing transcriptomics to try to understand what in the biofilm case about you know, what pathways are being impacted. You know what's being upregulated and down. I, it, it's it's you know all of that is, is sort of too too uh, preliminary to really say too much about. But you know hopefully in a year's time I'll be able to answer your question a lot more. I, I think that's what we want to know. I mean we want to understand how how these molecules function. I mean your know, biofilms are a little bit of a black box to some degree. I, I think there's a lot of different opinions about a lot of different things. Um, you know, and, and there's so much redundancy in many of these signaling pathways that, you know, simp for example, in the quorum sensing world, if you just go in and knock out one of these, um, you know, one of these systems, it turns out you don't actually prevent biofilms from forming because there's just a redundant system that, that replaces it um, in many of these bacteria. And so now if you do that in all of them, then that works. Um, but it's pretty unlikely that a small molecule is going to be doing that. And so, you know, it, it's, we, we don't know. But that's what we want to know. What do you want to know? Sure. Um, why do you choose sponges uh, yeah. to... Great question. Um, yeah, so I, I had this question uh, uh, a lot, actually. So, the, so from my point of view, the only selection we're making is based on the molecular structure. Right? So it just so happens the bacteria and sponges produce molecules we think are cool. Right? That, that's from my point of view. <coughs> In reality, the reason that sponges are a very valuable source is because they harbor all these bacteria, 
And if you were to think about the best factories of, of what's called secondary metabolites, so basically all the molecules that aren't required to survive to provide some, some beneficial function. Right, those are called secondary metabolites. And so you have your primary metabolism and then secondary metabolism, which is everything except for what's absolutely required. And so bacteria are probably the most prolific producers of molecules that, that are a very diverse and interesting structure. And that's true for a terrestrial bacteria. If you dig up the soil out here, that's full of bacteria that are making all kinds of fascinating molecules. But those molecules look different than the ones that are being made in the oceans, and, and they're just structurally unique. There's a lot of evolutionary reasons for that. Um, but, but they're, so for us, it just so happens. But in reality, in the ocean, the reason that they're not you know, grinding up some other thing and they're, and they're choosing sponges is just because they tend to have a much higher diversity of molecules that are like this. Do you think there's any other marine organisms of benefit to look at? Yeah, so there certainly are. Um, there's certainly other organisms that, you know, the oceans up until 15 or 20 years ago have been woefully underexplored in terms of their, their uh, diversity in terms of compounds. So the terrestrial world has been much more explored. But still daily there's compounds found that nobody found before terrestrially. And so you can imagine that the oceans are, are you know, you get what you look for, right? And, and resources are limited, and so you take a little submarine down, you grab some stuff, and you grind it up, and you look for molecules. I mean, that's, liter that's literally what happens, right? It's not any more glamorous than that. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes you find cool stuff, and sometimes you don't. And so obviously, if you have limited resources, you're going to focus on the things that have the highest likelihood of success until you absolutely have exhausted that, right? And so th that's where we are, I think. There's still a lot to look for. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a lot of other places you might look. Absolutely. <coughs> and you find very different kinds of structures. Um, you know, typically, people go into warm tropical waters. I personally think that's because they like to take warm tropical vacations. But no, no in, in reality, it's because warm waters have more biodiversity in them, right? So the temperatures allow for more, more things to happen biologically. But the second class of molecules that I talked about actually was isolated off the coast of Norway in really cold waters. Right? But the kinds of structures you find in these different environments are different. Um, and so, like I said, for us, I don't really care if they come from wherever, right? Because we're, we're sort of down the stream from that. But your question is a very important question at an earlier stage of where are we finding molecular diversity and can we do that better and, and why and how and where and all of that. So, so yeah, that's a, it's a very important point. Um, but you know, I, I hope that people continue to do that and are successful at it because that's where we get the ideas to start on with these molecules. Right? And if nobody isolates any new cool molecules, then we're just back to synthetically um, making things at random. And I, I didn't really get into this, but we could talk for hours about why starting with natural products has some inherent benefits to just randomly as as assembling atoms. Right, because I can give you guys, you know, I can give everybody a set of 50 atoms, and everybody can combine them randomly, right? You guys can make a collection of 500 molecules in no time, right? In general, your molecules are going to be much less biologically interesting than a panel of 500 natural products that I randomly find. And there's lots of reasons for that, and it's, you know, it's, uh, but, so that's why we want to use natural products as starting points, but it turns out that natural products aren't optimized, right? That sea sponge and those bacteria aren't treating your cancer, right? They know there's no connection there. It just so happens that the molecule does something, but it's not optimized to do that. And so where chemists come in is we want to take that molecule and fine tune it to actually make it relevant for that application. There's a lot of dotted lines in between there, but it's too long to describe right now. Do you have anything else? Thanks, Josh, again. Thank you. Thank you.